seated. morning. I'd like to welcome you here on behalf of Vaughn and Nancy and Sally, uh, their family, the extended family of Abert Ski Boat. We're here to uh, worship our God, to remember his grace, his faithfulness, and we are here to also receive his strength, his comfort, and his care as he is present with us in Jesus Christ. Our script, first scripture reading uh, this morning is from Psalm 121, a very familiar psalm. It begins with a question. It says, where does my help come from? And on a day like today, we need to remember that our help comes from the Lord. There are a lot of alternatives in the Old Testament. Uh, people could to turn to the mountains where there were oftentimes high places or mountains were permanent. The psalmist says, my help doesn't come from them. My help comes from the Lord. Psalm 121. I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Please join me in prayer. Our Father in heaven, as we gather we thank you for your love for us, for through Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the sure hope of eternal life that is given to all those who believe. We pray for your spirit, whom you have sent to comfort us, that he would be among us to give peace that passes all understanding. We pray for Vaughn and Nancy and Sally and their families, that they may especially know your presence. Grant us your blessing as we worship you at this time. And also bless us as we go from here to fellowship with family and friends, to continue our lives. Bless us with strength and comfort. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In Revelation 25, 21, we hear a picture of what God has planned for us, what Avert has received. And John the Apostle writes these words as he saw them, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be their God. And he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying, or pain, while well, the oral order of things has passed away. The death of a loved one, even if he has lived for 91 years, as Aver did, is a reminder of the frailness of our bodies and the brevity of our lives. We grieve because our father, grandfather, brother, and friend is no longer in this world. And that can't be changed. That's hard. And in the last year or so of his life, Maybe a little more, Abert lost a lot of who he was, and in the end, his body failed him. But this is not the end for him, and for that we rejoice. We know that early Monday morning, Abert's soul, his spirit, left him, and he was taken into heaven to be with our Lord. And we don't know when Jesus will return, but one day he will. And when he returns, Abert will be with him, and all who belong to him will rise to new life to the new hope and the new creation, receiving bodies that never fail and minds that never grow dim. And that's our hope this morning, the hope of the resurrection, the assurance of the resurrection in Jesus Christ. And our first song is about that resurrection, that we serve a risen Savior, and because of that, we can be sure of that hope as well. I think it's appropriate that we rise to sing for I serve a risen Savior.
seated. <clears throat> the family has chosen for the passage this morning a, a beautiful text from John's Gospel, John 14. I'm going to be reading verses 1 to 7. Uh, they had chosen 1 to 4, but I thought 1 to 7 um, gives a little bit more context for what uh, Jesus is saying. And Jesus says this, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. And Thomas, who was one of the disciples, said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. This is the word of our Lord. Family, friends, uh, sometimes when we read a Bible passage, as beautiful it is, as it is, it can be a little bit obscure. And I have to confess that sometimes I find John's gospel to be that way. John is saying things, and I am not sure I grasp the full depth of the meaning of that uh, particular passage. And that is probably true of this one as well. I was talking with Vaughn uh, and uh, Sally this past week as we were preparing for this, and uh, Vaughn shared with me what some insights to this passage that, that helped me understand it a great deal. Maybe I'd known them already. I, if I had, I'd forgotten them. I think I let on that I sort of knew what you were talking about, but actually I didn't. It was very helpful uh, for me. And, and he explained it this way, that in, in this passage has the language of marriage in it and betrothal. Of course, as we probably know, in biblical times, uh, they, the first step to marriage was betrothal, which is different from being engaged. Uh, where engagements, you can break them off. But betrothal was a legally binding uh, arrangement wherein uh, the, the bride and groom would uh, commit themselves to each other for life. But they weren't married because there was preparations to do. And the groom would uh, say to his betrothed, he said, I'm going to go home to my father, and he would end up living in his father's house, I'm going to build a room for you and prepare a celebration for you, and then when I have all that prepared, I will come and take you home to be with me. And we can see where that language comes from. It's very beautifully that Jesus is using that language here. He's telling his disciples that he's going away, but he tells them that he's going to come back and take them to be with him. And that's an appropriate language, I think, as we think about the church, as oftentimes called the Bride of Christ. Uh, as Paul, we heard already in Revelation, it's the, the church is the Bride of Christ, beautifully dressed for her husband. And so as we see there that Jesus is the groom preparing a place for his bride. And the description, uh, this is a description of what Jesus is doing. And, and Thomas then, and I wanted to read the next little part, uh, shows some consternation. He's a little bit puzzled by this, or a little bit um, troubled by this. Not puzzled so much as troubled. Because in that time, uh, the, the people believed, and, and believed that, that God was preparing a place of some sort for them, a paradise they would call it, but they didn't know where it was. And Jesus says, um, I will take you there, be where, there with me, and, and you know the place where I'm going. And Thomas says, I, I don't know. We don't know. Where are you going, Jesus? Can you, can you tell us? And Jesus doesn't say where it is, but he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus has gone to uh, prepare a place for us. And as I, I reflected on that, and uh, Vaughn's insight there, it was very helpful, especially at this time, and, and it's especially beautiful as we are here uh, remembering Abraham Skibout and acknowledge that God has called him home. Or as we would turn to that language of bride and groom, <clears throat> the groom has called one of the members of his bride to that room to where he belongs. And Abraham has a place, a room, in the house that God has prepared for him. I looked up that word room, and the, the word is actually <clears throat> the word that also gives rise to the Greek word abide or remain. This is not a hotel room. This is not a boarding house room. This is a room of permanence where Abraham may abide for a long time, for eternity even. And I think that's a beautiful thing for Abert. As many of you know, his uh, mother passed away when he was four years old. And uh, as happened often, uh, children, fathers were busy. And, and so Abert was uh, sent to live with relatives from time to time. 
uh, going from relative to relative, and, and they were wonderful in loving and caring, but we can imagine that he didn't feel his life was completely stable, always a chance of moving. And uh, God used this uh, moving for his advantage. Um, the family shared with me that, that uh, they have many relatives that they call grandma and grandpa or aunt and uncle who maybe are not. They're cousins and, and maybe beyond, but they were so blessed to be close to that family because Abert lived under their roofs. He was blessed by those who cares with him. But he didn't have that permanent place. A place that he could say, this is where I belong. And uh, he had sort of that in, in Barrens, just a little bit south of the town, uh, living in that beautiful place there in the prairie. Uh, but that wasn't permanent either. Nor was this permanent, uh, place permanent when he moved to Picture Butte and then on to Coaldale. Uh, those were only temporary, and, and we knew that. The family knew that because the disease that was laying waste to his mind uh, would eventually take his life. But we do acknowledge that there is no permanent place for us. We might live for many years in one place and say, this is our home, but we know it's not. It's not permanent. It's very temporary. And so then on, on Monday morning, early, uh, Jesus called Averett home and said, this is a place, a place for you, a permanent place. This is where you belong. This is what I have prepared for you. I, I am not sure that um, the picture I usually think of when I read this passage is necessarily helpful. I, I picture all the people saved, and, and that, that house of his father must be like a hotel with this long hallway, all these rooms. I'm not sure Avert would love living in a room on a hotel like that. I, I think he's too used to the prairie. I, I don't think we should picture it as rooms, but think about the meaning of the word, a permanent place a permanent place to, to be, and even more so to be in the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, how did Abert get that? Uh, Abert was a hard worker. I think most of you know that. I can see that from the farm that, that he built up. And, and he worked hard from the first uh, job he had of cleaning grass seed and barrens to having his own business to farming, even through difficult times in the 80s. And he did well. Abert did well. He managed to get ahead in life. He was a good farmer. He worked hard, um, maybe trying to show that this is the way he loved his children by providing for them, maybe finding himself trying to prove himself worthy. He worked hard. He accomplished a lot. But one of the things that he did not accomplish was a welcome to that room. And he knew it, as we do as well, that we don't earn that ourselves. We don't work hard to get to heaven. It doesn't matter what we do. We can't get there ourselves. And that was uh, Thomas's worry a little bit. He said, uh, we don't know where you're going, Jesus. He says, that, that's true. Uh, I can't think of a single person in this world who knows how to get to heaven all by themselves, who even knows where heaven is. And Jesus says, you don't need to worry about that. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I can provide that way. Thomas, you might not know where it is, but I do. And I'm coming back to you, for you. Uh, we can sort of picture the bride saying to her husband, you're going away to your father's house. I've never been there. Maybe it's somewhat distant. I don't know where it is. The groom says, don't worry about it. I'll be back. I'll provide the way. And of course, Jesus did. Through his death on the cross. The reason Avery is in heaven is not because he's a hard worker or did everything right. I was a really good man. He was sinful like the rest of us. But his salvation is in Jesus Christ. And he knew that he did not earn his way to heaven, but that was a gift to him. And we are so thankful for that. We're thankful for what God has given to Abraham. And I would say that, that he has received his room, his place. But I also need to say, I think we need to understand that this is not where he's going to be forever. We were at the graveside a few minutes ago, and, and uh, one day uh, Jesus is going to return, and all who belong to him will rise to new life, and we will have a new heaven and a new earth, a new creation, we're told. And I don't know what that's like, but um, certainly eternity is not sitting on a cloud strumming a harp. Although I imagine Avert liked harp music. Um, I'm not sure. He liked classical music. But that's not where we spend eternity. We will spend eternity in a new creation, and it'll be beautiful. Our bodies will be strong, our minds never dim. 
I don't know what it'd be like, but I was up there at the farm this past week and to see the sunrise over Lake Yuho in the morning and the sunset over the mountains at night, the vastness of the prairie before the house, the beauty of God's creation. And uh, I don't see Avert living in a city. I see him living in something like that, something that God provides, but it'll be permanent. It'll be beautiful. And there'll be no more crying, there'll be no more pain, no more suffering. No more dimming of the mind or the failing of the body because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And maybe, and I don't know what it's going to be like, maybe he'll be able to travel to the city to catch a symphony, as he loved to do, or turn on, I think it was Saturday afternoon at the opera, Saturday at the opera, uh, to listen. He loved opera. Um, I found that very interesting for a grain farmer to love opera, but he did. Tune into it, and maybe that'll be that. Maybe it'll be better than that. But that's what God has prepared for us. And that's what Avert has received. Not because he worked hard. Not because he earned it. But because of what Jesus Christ has done for him. And for that, we're so thankful. We're about to sing a song in a moment. Uh, It's one of the songs that the family chose. It's called Jesus Lives and So Do We. I have to confess, I don't think I've ever sung this song before. And the tune is not hard. It's probably, um, we can learn it if we haven't heard it. But let me read a couple of verses from it. Jesus Lives... And so do we. Death is, where is your sting so threatening? Jesus lives and cares for me, turns the grave to life unending. God will raise me from the dust. Jesus is my hope and trust. And then the other verse, not the second one, but I think the fourth. Jesus lives, this truth is sure. What What from Christ can separate me? Earth's powers I shall endure. Death nor hell can thwart my safety. God will raise me from the dust. Jesus is my hope and trust. And that is, I think, our hope and trust as well. That is the thing we hope for on this day when we lay to rest a loved one. It's not permanent. It's not forever. It seems like that. But one day, we will know the resurrection. And if we believe in Jesus, we will be among them to say, Jesus is my hope and trust. Please join me in prayer. Father, we thank you for your grace to us. We thank you for the life that you've given to Avert Skibout, for the impact he made on this community, for the blessing he was to his family. Lord, you sustained him through his years of pilgrimage here on this earth, and it is a pilgrimage because it was only temporary. He faced the, the last hurdle, the hurdle of death, and you brought him to the other side, and now he has that room, that place where he belongs, that, that place that's permanent. You blessed him, and we thank you for that. Thank you that we can celebrate his life and be confident that even as he experiences your presence, we can rejoice that he's before our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that that the same grace that, that upheld Avert in life and in death is also ours as well. That as we carry on in here and earth, we know that your strength is for us. May we always turn to you and receive your gift, especially the gift of eternal life that is found in Jesus Christ our Lord. Grant us your peace, we pray. As Avert has received that peace, we pray that it be ours, a peace that is beyond understanding, but one that that he now knows. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's rise to sing that song, Jesus Lives, and so do we. I wonder, Elaine, if you can play it through once and then we'll sing it. Let's rise together.
be seated. <clears throat> and I had said there was nobody to speak, but there actually is someone who is going to um, uh, say a few words uh, as we get the mic up here. I also have another uh, letter from uh, Joanne Hoffman, and uh, she would I would like to read that. Um, as we get the mic up here, I'll just wait for George for a second. Thanks, George. So let me just read from Joanne. She says, I am Joanne Hoffman, biological sister of Everett. I was adopted by the Hoffmans after our mother died in 1937. Everett came to live with us when I was in the fifth grade, and he was in grade 10. He was a good brother to me, but he liked to play tricks on me, such as leaving me at young people's without a ride. He also had great fun listening to my cousins and me talk girl talk, and then repeating our gossip at the supper table. One stormy night, Everett was stranded by the, on the road in a bad storm uh, on his way home from catechism. Many prayers were answered when the road patrol found him safe in the car. And often when I visited, I would sit in his shop listening to the classical music he played while he worked. When my daughters came with me to Alberta, we all enjoyed the sticky snacks consisting of crackers, cheese, and a couple of bottles of wine. In later years, uh, Joanne writes, we often communicated by phone. Those call calls always ended with, love you, bye. Today I always say to my dear brother, I also say to my dear brother, love you, bye, tot sains, until we meet again. That's from Joanne and Mike Hoffman. I'm going to invite also uh, Jim um, Hoffman, a cousin from Chicago, forward at this time. Jim. Pastor Gary, um, it's a, a pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm here uh, as an extension of, of my family in Michigan, um, the Hoffmans, the Postmans that are there. Uh, my brother made it real easy for me to get here, and uh, after a long flight last night, it's a pleasure to stand up here and uh, see so many uh, friendly faces. There are some folks that might not know who I am. I am the son of Timon Hoffman, who is the son of Martin and Rick Hoffman, and uh, almost a surrogate brother Everett. Um, my first memory of Everett was uh, him sleeping upstairs by my grandpa and grandma. I was just a little guy. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't say his name because it was kind of like Avert back then. So I called him Afy. And uh, every time I've seen him throughout my life, Afy comes up. <laughs> it's like my natural reaction to, uh, to Everett. Um, it, was, uh, it was the beginning of, uh, of a relationship that ran through my whole life. I remember... Uh, him quieting me when I was worried about wolves that would be hiding in the Karaganis bushes at my grandma's house. And he told me, there's no wolves, and if there are, I'll chase them away. <laughs> that was really young. I probably about four or five. Later on, when I was about eight, Everett uh, challenged me to water ski. And... Uh, he told me he'd give me five bucks if I got up the first time. So after practicing on the end of the bed uh, at my grandma's house, you know, how do you do this, trying to get ready, we went to Park Lake and met John Vandervalk in his speedboat. And doggone it, I got up the first time, and boy, was that five bucks huge. Um, but that's, that was uh, one of the things I remember. The other thing I remember about Everett was he was always encouraging. He encouraged me. He, he encouraged me to try stuff. And as a young guy, that's important to have role models like that that get down at your level and encourage you to do stuff or see things a different way. Um, 1967, I was 15. Canada was celebrating the Expo. And my mom and dad brought us up from 
Los Angeles, where Dad was serving at that time, to spend vacation here. So in June, we were here and uh, having fun with family and that kind of stuff, and um, came time to go, and uh, Mom and Dad made a possibly critical mistake in letting me stay. <laughs> I stayed at Everett and Tonya, and uh, Vaughn and... <laughs> Vaughn and Nancy and Sally were just little guys, you know, just tiny. And I, I slept in the basement and helped out at the seed uh, plant and helped out at the farm and uh, even did 300 acres of Summerfell for John Vandervalk. And, you know, it was, it was just an incredible time for me as a young guy. I tried some of the stuff that no 15-year-old uh, probably should, but cigarettes and whatnot, you know. But... Uh, Man, what a summer. Everett even gave me access to a pickup truck so I could drive into Nobleford in the evenings and talk to girls. Great summer. Later on, fast forward to uh, 1975. I graduated Calvin College and uh, was going to go to law school and wanted to take some time off to clear the studying out of my head. So I talked to Everett, and he said, well, why don't you come up here and work on the farm? I said, that sounds great. So I left Grand Rapids with the, my old Camaro U-Haul trailer behind it and towing two real Dutch girls. And we showed up in the uh, beginning of July uh, here, in, or end of uh, June here in 1967. Um, Everett had just finished his garage at the, at the uh, farm and uh, threw a big party. And I remember having friends of mine come down from Calgary and the whole nine yards. We had such a good time. And uh, I spent uh, that time working seed plant, farm, doing this, doing that, driving truck, a uh, little bit of everything. I made a joke that I was uh, getting doctoral uh, training at the U of E, the University of Everett. Believe me, I was uh, fairly serious about that remark. There's a lot of things I learned from Everett, things I use uh, every day. Uh, get up in the morning, you go to the place you're working, you make a plan. First thing, this is the way we're going to do it. One, two, three, four. Um, this ADD boy would not be a success at anything if I didn't make a plan. Because normally my head's going this way, that way, and every way. Um, so those valuable things I pulled from Everett back then were uh, really uh, consequential. Um, I ended up marrying that Dutch girl, one of them. <laughs> and. Uh, so after that, I was in pretty good uh, contact with Everett. As Joanne mentioned, uh, phone calls, they were long. <laughs> We'd go on for hours sometimes, and uh, I'd catch up on what's going around, up uh, around here, and uh, I'd fill them in where we were at. You know, Everett was a, a generous guy with his person and his time. That's my experience with him. The whole time I knew him, he was that way with me. He was also a generous guy uh, to so many people. I, I know there's people in my family, myself included, who were uh, beneficiaries of his, uh, of his uh, monetary help in times of uh, tightness or in times of support, supporting uh, good purposes uh, for people who were doing missionary work or whatever. He was that kind of guy. Um, it's been one of the best things in my life to have known Everett. Um, Tonya, the family, they've all found a place uh, in my heart and, uh, and helped make me who I am today. And uh, you guys sitting in the front row there, um, my condolences to you. We miss, uh, we miss Everett. I'm talking for my brothers, I'm talking for cousins, I'm talking for a bunch of folks out, out uh, in uh, Michigan 
and uh, that, that area. And uh, the last thing I'd like to say is appreciate what uh, the pastor had to say today. Everett knows, knows where his help comes from. He always did. And that was something he let me know too. And uh, I've got no worries about where he is today. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, for uh, your good words and uh, to get us to know him, get, help me to know him a little bit better. The impact we make on our on others' lives, we don't really know, and uh, sometimes we learn those things uh, and we can talk about them later. We're going to rise to um, use the words of um, the uh, rather the Heidelberg Catechism, question and answer one. Uh, the statement of faith. Uh, the question is um, one that I've said this before here in this church is one that every single person in this world needs to answer. We must answer this question and we have to answer it somehow. The question is what is your only comfort in life and in death? Now what makes you comfortable? What, what gives you strength to face every th possible thing that life could throw at you and even to uh, help you face that ultimate uh, trial that we must go through the death of our, our bodies? And uh, the answer is one that Everett knew and is one that we can say as well. So let's rise together to say these words. We'll remain standing afterward for God's blessing. People who are gathered here, what is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ by his Holy Spirit assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. As we prepare to leave this place, we are invited to join the family uh, and the fellowship hall for lunch and fellowship. Uh, they would love to have you uh, join them uh, for a time uh, after the service. As we leave this place, we also know that God is always with us, but it's good to hear his blessing, and so receive now his blessing. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's own Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit remain with you always. And together let us say, Amen. Our final uh, words this uh, morning are the words of the doxology, To God be the glory.